Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad that, in fact, we're not already running so late that the audience had actually thinned out to zero by the time it got to me. In fact, it suddenly accelerated, and um, yeah, well, that's that's good luck for me. Um, yeah, um, I'm of course the last man in on something that is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm the last man in on something that has been really very rich. I, I wasn't here right at the beginning, but from mid-morning, um, I've been um, yeah, wallowing in uh, a very rich set of contributions um, in which the concept of element was part of the language. There wasn't a lot said about the periodic table. Um, it was more a sort of an aside about sort of how, you know, this element is, is in the periodic table. And it is, um, but very little beyond that. And um, I think that's natural. The, the periodic table in some senses is, is really just um, the icing on, on the cake. Um, anyway, let me tell my story, which is um, to a degree history, but it's history that leads up to the present day and naturally leads to thinking about the future. And so that is what is behind the title, um, Chemistry's Big Bang uh, to One World Chemistry, as, as I hope you will indeed see in, in due course. So there are chapters to the story and uh, we do start with the chemistry Big Bang, and I've put in brackets the sort of um, time range uh, in which this event uh, took place, um, and I'll explain, or you'll probably see, why we should consider it as a Big Bang. And then we'll move on to looking at the benefits of chemistry, which to a large degree you might say, is reflected in the other contributions we've had during today. And then, of course, the, the clouds that are gathering around us and which are related to sustainable development. And finally, there is the implications for education in chemistry in this particular year. So that, that's the, the sort of lineup, and um, I hope the intentions are, are made clear here. So first, it's really, what is this chemistry Big Bang? And people who are scientists are, in fact, generally surprisingly ignorant because um, these things are passed over in most school curricula. But let's look at it. And here we see a Frenchman, um, Lavoisier, uh, and there are his dates. And you see he came to an abrupt end. If you look at the last point, he was guillotined um, when he was in his prime, you might say, because as it was reputed to have been said, the revolution had no cause to make use of scientists. And one shudders to think of, you know, close encounters with that kind of attitude in more recent times. Lavoisier was really all about elements, and um, he got on to elements, a subject which um, had been around ever since, um, yeah, the time of Christ and earlier still, the ancient Greek philosophers and so forth. The idea of an element which made up, or a range of elements that made up all the different substances. It's a very old idea, but Lavoisier was the first one who produced a definition and a method of testing whether or not a substance was an element. And so today when we use the word element, or sometimes chemical element, we're using language which he started for the first time with any substantial meaning whatsoever. And it was the great breakthrough. One cannot overemphasize that. It was the great breakthrough and started the Big Bang. And it all derived from his 
discovering, as it says here, a law of conservation of mass. And he used mass all the time to follow what was happening, in a manner of speaking. In the previous years, there had been a lot of distraction by all the smoke and flames and the energy transactions. Naturally, people sort of focused on that and they took no notice of mass. And Lavoisier, for reasons I'm not uh, able to say, um, really fixed on mass. And today it is second nature. You learn about how in chemistry you must always be weighing things and so forth. And it led on, you see, to what is called here the binary nomenclature of compounds. And we're using it all the time. And of course, something that is salt, when you have now realized it's made of two elements whose names you have given, you naturally come to the naming procedure that tells you from the name something about what the substance is made from. And he published this book in French with the very first list of chemical elements in 1789. That's substantially, of course, before the periodic table, which, as I say, was really the icing on top of a cake, which, in fact, Lavoisier started the making of. But the next in line was quite soon afterwards, and that was John Dalton, a very different sort of person. Again, if you look at the bottom, he was a school teacher in Manchester. Can you imagine today a school teacher in science in some local town developing chemical theory? I, I just don't think it's like that anymore, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and he came only about 25 years after Lavoisier had clarified what we should think of as elements, substances, as he said, that couldn't be broken down into anything simpler. And Dalton picked up the other ancient Greek idea of atoms and said, ah, this is what it is. It's in fact, this is where the atom and the element ideas actually in some senses come together. They're not the same, but they come together. And we now realize the significance of the element is that all of its atoms are the same. And they're not the same as the atoms of other, other elements, and so on. And he then went on in a really remarkable um, example of, of scientific hypothesizing. He said, if we assume that the atoms of different elements combine to make compounds, in simple ratios, and we'll try one to one unless we're forced to do otherwise, I can determine the relative weights of the atoms, which he'd never seen, and we've never seen either, essentially. And he indeed produced um, relative atomic weights. A quite incredible thing for somebody around about, as you see, 1808. And these were all related to hydrogen equals one. And um, so by 1808, you might say, both the atom and the element had been um, identified as usable concepts. And indeed, it was taken up by a number of really highly regarded, historically regarded scientists. And amongst you, I'm sure you do recognize all or almost all of these names. Avogadro, good heavens, yes. 1811, an Italian who was ignored because he was Italian and he wasn't French, German or English, he was ignored. And all the gases contained the same number of molecules. He distinguished between atoms and molecules. He even proposed, which was almost, you know, um, anti, uh, um, what is the right word? I don't know. Anyway. The idea that like atoms could combine, you know, this was really like a, a sexual encounter. If the atoms were different, it was okay. But if they were the same, it wouldn't be possible. I mean, that was ordained from above, was a kind of thinking. And he recognized that this was not true and that at like atoms can combine to form molecules. And that transformed another aspect of the picture. Faraday with laws of electrolysis, linking valency as combining capacity with electricity. Canetsaro at the first International Congress of Chemists. And finally, with atomic weights largely sort of sorted out, Mendeleev, 
to his great credit, recognized a relationship between element properties, and he says especially the valency, with atomic weights. And of course it is in this international year that that is the, if you like, the end game which Mendeleev's name is attached to. It is interesting to see, if you look at the citation that is there, that in fact in marking um, or recognizing this date, it is the development, and I'd like to emphasize that, of the periodic table of the elements, which is one of the most significant achievements. It is. It's the development of the periodic table, not just the periodic table as it is there now, which we all can use. That is absolutely true. But it is the development which was one of the most significant achievements in science. And we've seen during today exemplification of the broad implications, and it refers to several um, scientific disciplines, uh, astronomy, chemistry, physics, biology, other natural sciences. We, we could speak on the basis of what we've heard today to almost all of those things. And indeed, it is a unique tool and it is a really central characteristic of chemistry and chemical practice. And it has generated, as it says here, um, products necessary for humankind, our planet, and industrial de endeavors. Again, well illustrated during the course of today. What, what I'm showing here, and this of course goes to show, um, is a slide um, generated by uh, Professor Stephen Maitlin of IOCD, and I'll refer to this again later. It's not my slide, and uh, what it's showing, of course, as it says, is uh, global <clears throat> uh, GDP per capita over the years. And um, you'll see that it runs through, and it's not a linear scale along the bottom there, it runs through this period, which um, I'm placing emphasis on, as the big bang period. And if you look on here, you'd see um, somewhere just down here where I'm uh, looking at synthetic chemistry now, there's that red block, um, you'll see 1700, and then the next one that's actually recorded is 1820 and 1870 and so forth. I think you'll be able to read that. And what he has done here is to show in these red blocks um, what you might call basic scientific developments uh, and then the industries that flowed from them. And what you'll see is, if you remember, um, Lavoisier was somewhere just before, 18, in, before 1820 and, and Dalton too. So that both Lavoisier and Dalton had happened by then. And then the periodic table, you see, is about 1870. And you see that the curve steepens thereafter. And whilst it would be quite ridiculous to claim um, that the entire um, growth um, uh, that we see here is due to chemistry. What we're seeing is what flowed in those years following the development of the periodic table and to which those developments contributed. So here we have again and again synthetic chemistry, biochemistry, polymers and plastics, medicinal chemistry, analytical chemistry, agrochemistry and the industries of course solid state chemistry oh and i think that's as far as it goes and it is a very striking connection uh, between that historic development that i've called the big bang and the consequences that followed and again i say although they can be described as the benefits of chemistry for the world at large Clearly, it's not entirely so, but that steepening curve is clearly indicating the start of something big. So here is the curve um, of GDP per capita, shown nice and simple. And here on a, uh, a regular, yeah, it's a linear scale on the bottom here. These again are from Maitlin, uh, the world life expectancy. You see that incredibly steep climb in the period uh, somewhere around, hmm, I don't know, 1900 or so. 
So we could say, um, yeah, all of that looks very good, and, and, and chemistry and the periodic table and what led up to that from Dalton and Lavoisier all had this sort of remarkably positive kind of uh, consequence. And then we look at these sort of reports coming through increasingly and are very deliberately just selected some which are really very new, meaning 2019, and these are well understood um, concerns. And the first one about um, pollution and the number of people per year um, being killed by pollution, of which it is estimated in this report, 80% um, um, are attributable to air pollution. I find that really quite staggering, uh, but maybe others here uh, really don't. I don't know, but it is amazing. And then this remark, which of course for chemistry and chemistry related um, activities um, is very significant. The pace of production of new chemicals largely surpasses the capacity to fully assess their potential adverse effects on human health and ecosystems. So yet again a warning of what we are doing to ourselves because we're so clever but we're not clever enough. And then here from the uh, UN Forum on Climate Change, the climate change represents the single biggest threat to sustainable development everywhere, etc., etc. And it calls for urgent action to halt climate change and deal with its impacts, which is integral to the successful implementation of the sustainable development goals. I think everybody in this room knows this, and I'm certainly not wanting to labor it, but to move on from this awareness that all this brilliance starting from that Big Bang and the exploitation of what had been discovered and have become understood, all of that has led us in a huge rush into eventually a lot of negatives as well as benefits. So the benefits here, we have to say, have become negative benefits rather than positive benefits. And so we get these judgments now being made, quite rightly, on uh, what, do we, what do we do about this? And I think this is the sort of thing which is appropriate for us at this um, discussion forum to give um, attention to. Because after all, we are convened to talk about uh, sustainable development goals as well as about the international periodic table and its implications. And I don't think there's been too much uh, said specifically on this and I'm not a huge expert but I am a chemistry educator and I do feel we need to be making moves accordingly. And this business of sustainable development is something which the school system has largely ignored. There is this uh, position taken by IOCD, um, which is the International Organization for Chemical Sciences in Development. And you can see it on their website and they have published articles and so on and so forth. And they're calling for chemistry to reconsider itself, not because something bad about it, but it's incomplete. I think that's what it is. It's incomplete and in its own way is actually rather simple. I know that is outrageous, but compared to where we need to be. And the sort of beliefs that they are espousing here is, as it says, firstly, the chemistry cannot be separated from the context in which it's conducted and its practice must be considered in relation to its impacts on many interconnected systems. Chemistry, which has quite often been referred to as the central science, lying between physics on one side and biology on the other, must become a central sustainability science. And most importantly, for both teaching and practice, 
to be informed by systems thinking and consequently embrace approaches that cross disciplinary boundaries. Let me say once again, many in this room, for the very reason that you are here, have no problem with this. They will say, yeah, no, you will say, sure, 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 I, I'm already there, I'm already over the cross-disciplinary boundaries, I've crossed them, and I'm doing fine. But now we come to the educational thing, which of course is, is my particular interest in life, and of course we are in a particular country and I think for talking about education it is valuable to think about where we are and there was talk about skills availability well <laughs> yeah don't make me laugh I mean with the school system we have um, yeah we, we have a lot of problems so here we have let's be serious for a moment and say um, in our secondary schools, um, really in the context of the International Year of the Periodic Table, I mean we're really looking at chemistry as you might say, and when we look at the secondary school system, um, that chemistry is embedded in a subject uh, which is called physical sciences, uh, which in fact is a 50-50 combination, I won't say mix, because it's a completely heterogeneous mixture. There's no mixing, um, but it's physics and chemistry that make up the physical sciences on a 50-50 basis. And the document which sets out the curriculum, and which is the brief, you might say, for the teachers and for the textbook authors, um, it defines these knowledge areas which you study from grade 10 through to grade 12, um, you know, keeping an eye fixed on that particular knowledge area, like it could be mechanics or it could be chemical change, and you follow that all the way through the grades. And probably many of you are very familiar with this, with maybe even children already at this level. But the extraordinary thing is, when you look at that document, a huge thing like this, there's absolutely zero connection, according to the document, between those knowledge areas. Now that's only between physics and chemistry. There's no linkage at all. You look in vain for any hint that, well, we're talking about this concept here, you realize that this came up also in the other knowledge area. Just something to alert the teacher it's a connection that should be picked up. And there's also no reference to life sciences. So the document in fact is peddling a view of science which I think in terms of what I've just been saying is antithetical to the kind of thinking that we should be nurturing in the present and even more so in the future of all the sciences. It's no longer adequate to be expert solely in one discipline. It's interesting to see on reflection that there was actually a knowledge area called chemical systems. And you might say, oh, so there was systems thinking there introduced in 2003 and it was nearly 20 percent of the curriculum introduced at that time but it was then cut back you see and so from 2011 onwards we reverted back and in fact in 2003 this was a very forward kind of policy decision to embrace the notion of chemical systems at that time and climate change, global warming for example and uh, the, the world's uh, water systems were part and parcel of that. Let me just uh, give that kind of emphasis so you know what the systems thinking content um, actually was. But for whatever reason, and I can talk about it, but for various reasons anyway, it was killed off and now it is really just a trace only. So the argument I'm making is that we do need systems thinking in the school science curricula 
just as we need systems thinking in the kind of level and occupation in which you and I, to some small extent, are engaged. And to continue offering a curriculum, especially in physical sciences, but I think it would apply to other science uh, subjects, to continue to perpetuate a completely outmoded vision of what the sciences need to be currently and even more in the future which the education system is preparing young people for, it's necessary to consider systems thinking getting into the structure of the curriculum in some way. As it says here, one world chemistry, if we just focus on that, doesn't mean to say that we wipe out all the borderlines between the sciences. That creates a lot of philosophical problems and practical problems, but it does argue for stressing this unity of scientific principles and thought processes. And this should be done from a very early age, so that there's a growing awareness of the ways that chemistry, and by implication other sciences, interconnect with other disciplines. We do need to make this move. I teach at the present time final year uh, physical science teachers at Wits University. I can tell you their vision is incredibly narrow. Consistent with that is a movement that's been going on for a few years and you can see the time range 2010 to 2015. Some of it is coming out of the science education community. Some of it is coming out of leading um, scientific bodies like the National Academy of Sciences and this inter-academies project, these academies of science that they're talking about as an inter-academies project. And they are all for focusing, as it was saying before, let's just look at the words that are there, the unity of scientific principles and thought processes. That is what this is about, big ideas of science and about science. And if you sort of wonder what does that sort of thing mean, it means looking at things in those examples there. All matter in the universe is made of very small particles. You might think that's very, very trivial, but the notion is, um, in a sense, you know that, you know that, uh, but you have to evolve that in the way that the periodic table, in fact, evolved. And you have to follow that big idea from very elementary grades progressively as you advance the teaching of the particular scientific discipline. And of course, science is about finding the cause or causes of phenomena in the natural world. These are just examples that are taken from the uh, publications of these um, bodies. So big ideas of science and big ideas about science are the sort of thing we should give some attention to. They are certainly not evident, as you might imagine, in the physical sciences curriculum. You can't see any big ideas. The big ideas actually seem to be things like mechanics or chemical change. But those actually, of course, are nothing of the sort. They're just divisions of the content that has to be covered. Okay. And it leads on to, especially in relation to the nature of science itself, um, inquiry-based science education pedagogy. Now, pedagogy is a word that always makes scientists sort of curl uh, because they think it's sort of so artificial. But okay, it's, it's sort of teaching approaches is perhaps the, the word that we want there in a, in a scientific audience. Inquiry-based means trying to make sense of new experiences, etc., etc., as it lays out there. It's not presenting the facts, not presenting something that was done maybe a hundred years ago as if it's a fait accompli and with no hint of where it's come from or of the development process <clears throat> that lies behind it. And so indeed, 
We have big ideas as one construct. I mentioned that just now in terms of a science education for the present and for the future. And now we have inquiry based. So we're looking towards inquiry based development of those big ideas if you run the two things together. Okay. And here, just to sort of set one on one's way, is this sort of quote um, from the American Chemical Society in the first instance. They have a publication, American Chemical Society, Sustainable Chemistry and Engineering. It's not even terribly recent, 2014. And so it's a, an appeal, if you like, to um, all who will listen that we need to educate in a way that recognizes that we have a crisis. At the present time, um, certainly in the educational sphere, as presented to secondary school students, as taught to those teachers who are to be the teachers next year and for the next decade, it's not there. It's not there at all. So we're looking at a typical educational situation. They say education is always 25 years behind what is actually happening in the real world. Well, yes, and that is, I'm afraid, being reconfirmed unless we press for something to happen. And I do think that if we reflect on what I've been saying, we have here in one story which of course would take a long time to tell in a school system. Um, we have a story here of how scientists grappled with some very, very basic concepts which are common currency today. And it is of course elements and atoms. Very little was mention was made of atoms during today. It's very interesting, you kept using the word element but, you know, atom is the other side of the coin. To start the story from grappling with the significance of those concepts and their meaning, their application and their development and so forth, and of course, ultimately, to a condition we now find ourselves in, which is really quite problematic. And as it says, it's a crisis of existence. So I have recommendations as a conclusion and as it says, in view of the urgent imperatives of the Sustainable Development Goals, I do think this call that NSTF should convene a discussion forum devoted to the reconstruction of science curricula in South Africa. And I'm saying that in the context of what I've been saying about the need for systems thinking in order to achieve some hope of sustainability. And certainly there can be the development of materials that can be used by teacher educators especially that can exploit the story behind the international year. So I think that is all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention.